So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. As I said, uh, my name is Andrew Westby, and I'm the director of the Natural Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich. And it's our absolute pleasure uh, to host this uh, international seminar on food and nutrition security in Africa, um, which relates to an, initi an initiative uh, that we call FANSI, which is the Food and Nutrition Security uh, Initiative. So to kick us off and welcome us all today, I'd like to introduce uh, Jane Harrington, uh, who's the Vice Chancellor of the University of, of Greenwich. Thank you, Jane. Thank, thanks. Thank you, Andrew, for that. And um, hello, everyone. I, I'd like to extend a massive welcome to you all for joining us for the FANSI or Food and Nutrition Security in Africa conference. And we're absolutely delighted, actually, that we've got so many external presenters and delegates joining us today. And joining us also from a huge range of countries and places around the world. And whilst we were hoping initially, like so many things in life at the moment, to, for this to take place face to face, the pandemic has meant that we've had to revise how we do this. But one of the advantages, oh, I don't think there's many advantages, but one of the advantages probably is that we can actually have more people join us today. So I, I really hope that you get a huge amount out of this seminar. What you'll hear is um, some amazing external speakers, but also our brilliant um, staff from the Natural Resources Institute. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us during these strange times. Now, I'm not going to take up a huge amount of time today, but what I did want to do is just spend a couple of minutes reflecting on how we got where we are today. And so if I just start and have a bit of reflection on actually some of the funding that's enabled us to do this, because in June 2019, we, um, the Natural Resources Institute won seven and a half million pounds through, from Research England through its Expanding Excellence in England scheme. And that was really to expand the work that the Natural Resources Institute was doing with partners and to expand their own research capacity to address global challenges using a food systems approach that are impacting food and nutrition security, particularly in Africa. And as Andrew will explain in a few minutes, this includes climate change, food loss and waste, and sustainable agricultural intensification. And what the funding's done is it's allowed us to recruit 25 new staff and 18 new PhD students. And I know many of you are here today listening. So hello from me if you're here. It's great to have you on board. Now, the excellence of the Natural Resources Institute's work on food security has been recognised in many ways. And one of those has been through three Queen's Anniversary Prizes. Now, for those of you who don't know very much about Queen's Anniversary Prizes, they're basically the Oscars for higher education and further education. So to win one is an achievement. To win two is fantastic, but three is absolutely amazing. And the most recent one was last year for our work on innovative pest management. Now, even before the latest award from Research England, our team here in the Natural Resources Institute has really helped to improve the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm absolutely confident that with this additional support, this will carry on and, we'll, and it will be hundreds of thousands more people. And one of, there's many reasons why this project's important to me and it's important to the university, but one of them that's really fundamental is because it represents the values and purpose of our university, which is health, sustainability, inclusivity, collaboration and impact. And they underpin everything that we do. And, this re and the research in this area is absolutely integral to that. Now, some of you will know that we're among the world's best universities for the delivery of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we've also won a Times Higher Award for Outstanding Contribution to Sustainable Development. And of course, things like climate change, conflict, pests and disease are the very things that affect food security. Now, I'm absolutely not an expert in these, so I'm going to hand over to Professor Andrew Westby, who absolutely is an expert on these. But before I do, I'd just really like to finish by saying a huge thank you to you all for the work that you do 
because it's work that makes our world a better place and it's work that we really need right now. So thank you so much. And I really hope you enjoy today. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jane. Uh, really appreciate you, uh, you, you joining us today. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, th thank you all for joining us today. And uh, you know, uh, I'd like to thank in advance our, our presenters today uh, for joining us and, uh, and uh, Paul Boateng, who's going to um, uh, moderate the session today. Uh, but as a way of introduction, I'm going to say a little bit about this initiative that uh, Jane just described to us, the Food and Nutrition Security Initiative uh, of the Natural Resources Institute, which really does fit into food and nutrition security in Africa. But in many ways, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has made life worse and more difficult for everyone. But even before this, uh, there's 256 million people in Africa who are undernourished, and that's just a tragedy, I think. Uh, and and you know, and that's just in Africa, and you know, the situation it can be bad in other parts of the world. But in 2021, the United Nations has recognised the importance of changing our food systems, um, transforming our um, uh, the way that we produce and consume food. To improve our, to improve uh, the, the health of populations, but also to preserve our environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's this big summit happening um, towards the end of the year, uh, and there's uh, five action tracks within that that all relate to this issue of food and nutrition security. I think are very relevant to Africa, and those are ensuring safe access to to safe nutrition food for all, a, a shift to sustainable uh, consumption and production patterns boosting nature positive production, uh, advanced equitable livelihoods, and building resilience to vulnerabilities, shocks and stresses. And the UK as a country has decided to take a lead role in two of those tracks, uh, track three and track four. And I know that one of our speakers, uh, Shakuntala uh, Tilstead, is, uh, is, in, is in a leadership position for track four on equitable livelihoods. So Jane mentioned earlier uh, this new initiative that we have, the Food Nutrition Security Initiative, uh, which is part of, funded by Research, Research England as part of the Expanding and Excellence in England scheme. <clears throat> so just, just to give you some, uh, some idea of the extent of uh, NRI's collaborative work in Africa, I must say partnerships is really central to what, to what NRI does. And, um, and, and we have partners and are currently working, have recently been working in all the countries shaded green on this map, which just gives you an indication of the breadth, depth, north, southness of the relationships that we have. So this new initiative that we have, which we call the Food Nutrition Security Initiative, FANCY, comes from investment from Research England but also from the University of Greenwich. You know, we have to, uh, you know, <clears throat> it was part of the conditions of the award. The university also made a contribution. And that has allowed us to employ more staff, to build new infrastructure and employ some PhD students. But our partners are really important to that. And we have th these three important group groups of partners. Those are uh, ones in African universities, um, ones involved in, in, in the CGIR, centres and programmes, and a number of UK partners. I'll go on to say a little bit more about that. So in terms of making a contribution, uh, we've been able to increase the, the extent and the size of what we're doing. And what we're going to do, or we are doing, is focusing on four key areas, which are climate change, agriculture and natural resources, sustainable agricultural intensification, food loss and waste, and food systems for improved nutrition. But our other themes of work within NRI are also really important to contributing towards food and nutrition security. Um, th those are um, innovative pest and vector management, gender and social difference, uh, sustainable trade and responsible business, and work on, on, on land, rural institutions, governance and finance. 
And our approach uh, really, it, it fits into this food systems approach, where recognizing the complexity of food systems. It's not just the food chain uh, from, uh, from production to consumption, it's everything that goes around it in terms of, of society, the economy, politics, health, and the environment. And uh, you know, so if we can make some inputs into that and change it in collaboration with our partners, then we'll contribute to the sustainable development goals. So these are our programmes uh, that were highlighted on, on the previous slide and the ones in gold are, are the ones that we'll be investing in. Uh, but uh, as Jane has indicated, we have been very lucky to, uh, to receive uh, three Queen's Anniversary Prizes for our work, for our work um, on food nutrition security. The first back in 2000 was actually for our work on food security in Africa. Uh, the most recent one uh, was, uh, was work on in innovative pest and vector management, uh, looking at issues of uh, black, uh, uh, black fly transmitting uh, onchocerciasis or river blindness, uh, control of uh, rodents and, and the diseases that they transmit, mosquitoes and of course malaria, and, and pests that threaten the horticulture industry. Our previous award to that back in 2015 was around, was around our work on cassava, which was exclusively focused on Africa, which looked at pest and diseases, value addition, uh, use of wastes and capacity strengthening. So with this new initiative, we've managed to employ 25 new, new staff, which is, which is really exciting. And this is what they look like. Uh, I had a real pleasure putting this slide together because it's the first time I've actually brought everyone together in one place because of the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, pandemic, we've not been able to bring people together. Uh, so we currently have people still based in Australia and Kenya and, uh, and, and Uganda and different parts of the world. So it's a real pleasure to bring everyone together here. And I've just, I haven't put everyone's job description here, but I've just fly, uh, flagged up some of the key issues um, that we are addressing. And these include... Uh, food systems to improve nutrition, uh, public health nutrition, issues of bioinformatics, biostatistics, behaviour change. If we don't be change our behaviours, then you know, we're not going to make the, the difference to people's lives that we need to make. Uh, issues of food safety, climate change, state fragility. Uh, what happens in post-conflict areas? How do we ensure uh, food security in those very different and difficult situations? issues of gender, agroforestry, soils, and rural institutions, etc. So that's the staff side of the investment that we've had. Uh, the important part of it are, are, are the partners and, um, that we're working with. Um, so we do work with a wide variety of partners. These are partners that particularly uh, supported um, th this bid that we made, but this is not a, a closed shop. This is very much an open shop for new collaborations. Uh, so here's a list of African universities who generally have uh, World Bank centers of excellence that, that interface with the areas that, that we're working with, a number of CGR centers and programs, and it's great to have Shakuntila talking uh, today about her, her, uh, uh, World Fisher's work in collaboration with us, some of it, uh, around aquatic systems, uh, ISIPI, and then two UK institutions, NIA BMR and Rothamsted Research. We've also supported uh, now up to 20 PhD students, and we are really keen to include this in our bid for several reasons. So one is that these PhD students will be the next generation of food nutrition security leaders. Uh, they provide opportunities for us to build those collaborative linkages, particularly with uh, African universities, and they also kickstart the collaborative work of the new staff um, that we've employed. We've also had this in investment in infrastructure and there's three new facilities, just two of them on these uh, pictures. One is uh, some, some new uh, climate control greenhouse space. So we can do some of that important work around climate change and diseases, etc. A new food innovation laboratory, which is an empty laboratory, as you see. Uh, we're just about filling it uh, with equipment now, and also an agronomy and soils laboratory. So the world, in many ways, has moved to food systems uh, research, and um, uh, NRI's interest in food systems research is not only in Africa, it's also here on our doorstep in Kent in the UK. And I'm delighted to say that we've just been awarded in collaboration with uh, these wide range of partners uh, at the bottom, a new center for doctoral training on UK food systems. 
So it's taking that same approach of looking, of understanding the complexity, uh, aiming towards healthy people, a healthy environment, healthy society, and a healthy economy. And I put, I put some links in there in terms of um, uh, that new doctoral training center that is just um, open for applications uh, right now. And that's, I should have said that's funded by UKRI through its Transforming UK uh, Food System Strategic Fund. So the seminar today, uh, and uh, as you see, uh, there's a picture of Paul there, which is my reminder, this is where I finish and this is where I hand over to Paul. But I, you know, we have some really excellent uh, presentations here uh, from Shaq and Tilsted, Tils uh, Jemima Nunjuki, uh, Matthew Wyatt, Molly Brown and Nicola Lowe. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they've got to say and hearing your questions as we start to think through um, how we, in collaboration with you, can bring about these changes in the food systems that will improve food nutrition security and improve life in general. So on that note, Paul, I'll pass on to you uh, and I'll stop showing my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. It's good to be Good to be with you all uh, today. Um, my job is to moderate this session. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Chancellor of the University of Greenwich, which of course houses the NRI. But you know, I was um, brought up in the Eastern region of, uh, of Ghana in West Africa. My grandparents uh, were cocoa and cassava farmers in Achim. And in our tradition, by way of introduction, uh, you don't give names and titles and jobs. They don't even ask you who your parents were. They ask you just one question, one question only. Why are you here? Why are you here? And if you think uh, about it, that's really the best question to ask uh, by way of introduction. Uh, and I'm here, as I imagine all of you are, because we believe that food and nutrition security lies at the heart of development. Uh, all of us hold that view. We're very fortunate uh, this afternoon, uh, we're very fortunate today to have uh, with us a range of speakers, and I'll be introducing them to you now, but in introducing them, we're conscious that this is an exercise, putting food and nutrition security at the heart of development, is an exercise that takes place within a context. And the context is one of a global pandemic. The context is one in which Africa in particular uh, faces real issues, yes, around the pandemic, around a food security crisis, but that takes place as part and parcel of a series of overlapping crises uh, that includes health, uh, it includes the economy, low commodity prices, a decline in global financial flows. All those things have a bearing on how we respond to this crisis. So it's never been more important than to have sessions such as the one we're engaged in today, in which we come together to share ideas. We come together to share those ideas with a purpose, and that's making a difference, that's moving the dial. And in doing that, all of us are important. So your questions, your contributions, are all things that we want to pick up today, and indeed to take forward and run with into the future. So please use your chat uh, column, uh, uh, put your questions in, uh, I'm ably assisted by Tim and with technical backup from James, and hopefully we'll get those questions answered. Uh, some of them immediately after each speaker has uh, spoken, and then others uh, at the uh, end of hearing all the speakers when we'll have a, a, general, a general conversation. Uh, the rules are, they ask you put your questions in, but also and importantly, we're running strictly to time. Our aim is to get you out of this session, back into your busy lives by 3.30. So I'm gonna be quite tough uh, when it comes to the timing uh, of our speakers and managing the conversation that we are going 
to have. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce to you our, our first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Tilstead, uh, Shankutala Tilstead, who of course will be known uh, to uh, uh, many uh, uh, of you, looking and sharing uh, with us uh, real and important uh, insights into nourishing Africa, aquatic food, foods in food systems. So uh, over to you, Dr. Tilstead. Thank you so much. And good evening from Penang, Malaysia, where I am here based at the Wolfish headquarters. I'd like to thank the Natural Resources Institute, our partner at the University of Greenwich for inviting me to talk at this international seminar on food and nutrition security in Africa. Next slide, please. In my presentation, I will focus on nourishing Africa and the peoples of Africa through aquatic foods and food systems. I will give an introduction to the food systems framework that we use, the benefits of aquatic foods for nourishing Africa. And as many of you know, fish is ex an extremely important component in the diets of many Africans. In many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, fish is the main animal source food, even though the consumption is quite low. I will use the food systems framework to show the benefits of aquatic foods in diets for improving nutrition and health. And drawing on scientific evidence, I will present why aquatic foods have a unique and beneficial role in food systems in Africa. Then I will give some examples of the actions which are being carried out, some by World Fish in collaboration with NRI, to, and others which we would like to take on at a later stage to increase the potential of the benefits of aquatic foods in nourishing nations in Africa. And building on ongoing collaboration by NRI and Wolfish, I will give some key messages for further actions to expand and sustain the progress in nourishing the peoples of Africa with aquatic foods. Next slide, please. Firstly, let me give an overview of the food and nutrition security or, or global and, and in Africa. And um, um, Dr. Westby has already talked about the, so the, uh, the sustainable development goals and the dire situation that we are facing with uh, undernutrition and malnutrition in many parts of the world and especially in Africa. But as you can see from few of the figures that I've pulled up, that we, and th this comes out from the last the SOFI report in, in uh, 2020, we talk, we, the estimates are that 2 billion people, a quarter of the global population, experience hunger or do not have regular access to nutritious and safe foods. And 3 billion people cannot afford the cheapest healthy diet. One fifth of children under five years of age are stunted. And about 50% of children suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. And as one aspect of malnutrition, we are also seeing that adult obesity and also ch ch obesity in children is continuing to rise. And if we look at Africa, 250 million people are estimated to be undernourished. And this percentage is twice that of the global prevalence. 40% of the children are stunted. And about, again, a quarter of the children are overweight. This is quite quite an issue for us when we talk about malnutrition because at one end you have people you have children who are undernourished and at the other end you have children who are overnourished but only in terms of energy and become overweight next slide please so as i said i will give an overview of the um of the food and nutrition, I will give an overview of the food systems framework that we are using. And as you can see here, that this 
Food Systems Framework, which was launched by the Committee of, on Global Food Security, is being adopted by many as a means of tackling these enormous global challenges of food and nutrition security. And as you look to the right, the intent is to improve nutrition and health outcomes. And then we know that if we do so, we will be nourishing nations. This framework is very comprehensive and offers opportunities for improvements through many different entry points. So let's look at the entry points that I will be using. If you look at the top, for example, you have the drivers, and I will be talking about socio and cultural drivers. Then if you look at the middle part of the food systems framework, I would give examples from the boxes of food supply chains, food environments, consumer behavior, and diets. And then also from the box at the bottom on political program and institutional actions. I will use this food systems framework throughout my presentation. And I will show how aquatic foods fit into the food systems framework and how we can further make use of this framework to augment the benefits of aquatic foods for nutrition and health outcomes at the end and thereby nourish Africa. Next slide, please. Why is it important to prioritize aquatic foods in the food systems framework for nourishing Africa? Well, fish and other aquatic foods possess many unique and important characteristics. If you take Africa, we have a bountiful supply of fish from many different sources, diverse species. These fish are well like, they are seasonal and therefore can be used with other foods in the diets that are also seasonal. They are culturally acceptable across the board. Well, of course, I mean, if you go to some population groups like the Maasai, fish is not a, a, a common part of the diet, but in general, it, they are. And also the la la later um, research evidence is showing that fish and aquatic foods have a low environmental cost. So if we can use aquatic foods, we can transform food systems through a sustainable supply of fish and other aquatic foods, but we must ensure that these foods are safe, affordable, nutritious, and accessible for all. Next slide, please. Fish contains multiple highly bioavailable micronutrients. And this is a change that, that we have from, well, former years or where we are now. Um, in the past, you would hear and still do, you would hear many talk about fish as a protein food. Yes, it's rich in animal protein, but for coming from nutrition, uh, from a nutrition background as I have, and looking at diets and what's important in diets, especially for the poor and vulnerable. More importantly, are the micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals that are found in fish. And for example, if I would take just one of the vitamins, vitamin B12, which is found only in animal source foods, vitamin B12 is essential for brain development and cognition. Next slide, please. And if we look at some of the examples of sources of fish in Africa from the lakes and the small fish that are found in the lakes, we can see that many of these common small fish species are rich sources of essential fatty acids. And women who consume these fish have, well, of course, you'd have to consume a certain quantity of these fish, have higher concentrations of essential fatty acids in their breast milk, thus enhancing growth, 
development and cognition in their children. Next slide, please. In particular, and the I'd like to talk about small fish. And as many of you know, if you look at the consumption patterns from many Africa, sub-Saharan African countries, you would see that the majority of fish that's consumed are small size fish species, especially by the poor and vulnerable. And these small fish have unique qualities in the way they're used in diets and the way they can be accessible to the poor. For example, you buy them and you can buy in the markets in very small portions, so they, become, so they are affordable. There's minimal cleaning loss and plate waste, so you are getting the whole nutritional benefits. And it brings with it added nutrients because many times these fish are cooked with other ve with, va with vegetables spices further improving the micronutrient intake and being small they are consumed whole where you get the benefits of all parts of the fish the head the organs and the bones which have very highly bioavailable micronutrients in this respect the processing of small fish. Is that okay? Carry on, we can hear you. Okay. In, in that respect, the processing of small fish into dried small fish is extremely important because by, 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 may, by, by having the fish dried, you remove the moisture content. So the, the nutrient concentration is times four which means that it's, a, it's an extremely superfood with respect to the to micronutrients. In addition, it is easy to store because, because it is dried, so you can have a long shelf life. You do not need refrigeration and therefore can be used as a convenient, easy to use foods in many, in many meals and in many recipes. Next slide, please. Let me briefly give you some selected evidence, and I've only pulled out um, evidence of research that has been done in African countries. And these are just some of the examples. So we've seen that fish optimizes micronutrients, which include iron, zinc, and calcium from intakes in, in children. We've seen um, a strong association between high fish intake and low stunting in children in Zambia. And we've seen, we've seen this is not, this is in general, that women or from, um, from mega studies, um, which, are, which have been carried out, that women consuming a certain amount of, of fish per week, that they, it has resulted in better neurocognitive development and IQ in their children. In rural Malawi, an intervention with fish in young children resulted in the fish consumption, giving you greater muscle mass and, and larger mid upper arm circumference, circumference which is a, which, dig, which, which specifies the nutritional status of the child. And in rural Malawi, a common Hi. food supplemented with, with fish. Could I, remind, could I remind everybody, please stay on mute so we can hear Dr. Philstead without interruption. Please mute yourselves. Thank you, Dr. Philstead. Thank you. So, uh, in, and as part of a complementary food, it led to greater rate in children in rural Malawi. And in Nigeria, there's one piece of research that fish powder has been used to effectively treat rickets in children. Now, with all this evidence that I've given, yet we haven't been able to use the full potential of fish and aquat other aquatic foods in food systems in Africa. Next slide, please. And if we look at the consumption patterns in Africa, as you can see, the con and these are apparent consumption figures taken from FAO, which is based not on not directly on what people eat, but on estimates of production. But nevertheless, as you can see, the 
consumption, apparent consumption in, in Africa is much lower than that in Southeast Asia and much lower than the global consumption. So if we would like to reap the full benefits of aquatic foods in Africa, we have to up the consumption of fish and other aquatic foods and do so, especially in the poor and vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. So going back to the food systems framework, I would like to start with the different pathways and give examples of the different pathways. And the way I would do this is move from the boxes, starting with diets, all through in the middle, the food supply chains, and then give an example from the top but from the top boxes on drivers and then from the bottom box on political and, and political program and institutional actions. So let's start with diets. Next slide, please. And these are examples of work that we've World Fish and others with partners in Africa and with NRI have been doing. So in Malawi and Zambia, we have looked at using fish powder and fish chutney in Malawi made from whole dried fish to increase the quantity and quality of fish in the diets. And we focus especially on women and children in the first thousand days of life. So that's pregnant and lactating women and children up to the year, up to the age of two years. And because we know that this is an extremely important, this is a critical window for having improvements in women and children at this stage of their life. Next slide, please. If we look at the next box on the food in the food systems framework, moving along the middle, then we, we, we talk about consumer behavior. And some of, the, um, some of the actions that we've taken in this is integrating social behavior, change communication, and nutrition messaging for increased consumption, not only through the agriculture sector, but also through the health se sector. A next avenue that we've used is looking at avenues to use consumer demand to pull consumption. In the past, we've just used supply to push consumption by increasing, for example, the production of fish. But now there is a lot of evidence showing that perhaps the best or the better way to increase consumption is by pulling from consumer demand. For example, if you would focus, focus on use and use digital platforms, you can then promote nutrition messaging and the benefits of consuming fish and thereby increase consumption in youth. Next slide, please. So the next box we had along the food along the food systems framework is the food environments. And for this, I'd like to give some examples. We've been working with FAO in a big um, many multi-year project on illuminating hidden harvest. Also um, Duke University is part of this project. And we've seen through the, um, through the analysis of data that close proximity to water bodies is positively associated with increased fish intake and nutrient adequacy in young children. We've also, we've, we're also working with improving the food safety. For example, the solar drying of fish instead of traditional sun drying, you get a greater quantity of fish product, but you also get a product of better quality, less salt, no, in, no use of insecticides to keep flies away. And together with NRI, we want to continue this work to develop value chains interventions for making fish accessible to children who live further away from water bodies. For example, the urban poor. We can't bring them to the urban to the to the water bodies, but we can make the fish access from the water bodies accessible to these children who live further away. We would like to scale up the use of solar drying tents, and there are different options of this tents that solar drying um, 
tents that can be used for communities, that can be used for households, and portable solar energy tents that can be moved from household to household. And going further, we would work with applying a One Health approach to support the call to action for improved food quality and safety with respect to people, animal, and environment. And as we all know now, this One Health approach is becoming more important with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. With respect to the food supply chains, this is the area where many interventions have taken place in the past through production systems. Um, but if we should consider some pathways to increase supplies of fish and at the same time the quality and having a nutritional benefit, then we should be looking at, at uh, then we should be looking at having actions which support nutrition sensitive production systems through our true fisheries management, both inland and coastal management and aquaculture systems. And as I said in the past, much efforts have been taken, have been used and much investments have been used on production systems, increasing the quantity of fish. But importantly, it is also it is also imperative that reduce that we reduce fish waste and fish loss and we look at the circular economy to increase the supply of fish next slide please so as we know, the estimates of food is about one third of the food is lost, and that holds the, that is the estimate that's also given for fish. And the ways that we want to work further with increasing the fish the, food, the fish supply is to reduce fish that you that's used for animal feed for fish meal and feed oil that take, that's taking place in many countries, for example, in West Africa to improve the methods for processing and storing, as I have talked about soda drying. And perhaps not so important, I guess, in, in poorer communities to use fish parts which are removed, uh, use them in a circular economy. But in many African countries we know, and especially for the poor and vulnerable, nearly all of the fish is consumed also because many of the fish that's consumed are the small fish. So if you would do a back of the envelope calculation, you'd see that a 1% reduction in the fish loss in Zambia amounts to 10 kgs of fish per person per year for 250,000 people. So this is, an, this is an important pathway that we should, that we would work together with NRIS because this is one also one of the strong um, areas of research for NRI. Next slide, please. Please. You have about two minutes, Dr. Thilstead. Okay. So here, um, if we see, go back to the food systems framework, I've, I've given examples for the middle part of the framework, diets, consumer behavior, food environments, and food supply chains. Let me give an example for the drivers, and then one and then an example for the political program and institution actions, and then I'll stop there. Next slide, please. So the socio-cultural drivers, one of the important areas that we want to expand is the engagement of women in aquatic food systems, combined with social behavior change and nutrition messaging, as we know that this would lead to better nourishment for women and their children. And if we can improve the, the conditions and benefits that women have and their engagement in the aquatic foods, then we would have a greater, uh, we, we would have a, a, a greater impact on nourishing themselves and their children. And this is one of the areas that I would prioritize being in the lead of the uh, UN action track um, on uh, for action track for inequitable livelihoods. Next slide, please. 
Another driver I want to talk about is the, is the warming oceans. So we know that the oceans are being warm and this is going to affect many of the populations in the tropics because we don't, because there are models that show you will warm in oceans that the fish in the, trop, in, the, in, in the tropics will move away to more cooler zones, higher latitudes and thereby become become unaccessible to these population groups. And this can have stark effects on micronutrient intakes and thereby increasing micronutrient deficiencies. Next slide, please. This is the last one I would give for the political program and institutional actions. We all, one of the ways that we can improve the benefits of fish is by highlighting fish and other aquatic animals in national food-based dietary guidelines. We've seen how this is done in many high-income countries, for example, Denmark, um, that increases fish, fish intake. And now even more so, governments should be working and they should be in, enduring themselves to the right to foods and making sure that programs such as school feeding programs and safety net programs include nutritious foods. And an easy nutritious food to include is dried small fish. Next slide, please. So these are my key messages. Invest in the analysis of nutrient content in food safety of aquatic foods. Promote the increased supply of aquatic foods using nutrition sensitive approaches and promote the consumption of tasty, nutritious, safe, affordable, and convenient aquatic foods like fish powder. Influence the global and national policy makers for policy chains and even more so for investments so that aquatic foods can nourish Africa. Thank you, next slide. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Thelstead, for that fascinating presentation. A couple of points coming up from the chat column from uh, already uh, Aureli uh, and and Maureen, uh, and I would add to them this issue of access. Um, landlocked countries, countries where there isn't ready access to um, the sea or lakes or to the product of sea or lakes. Um, how are you addressing uh, that issue, uh, both in the context of transportation? I mean, I remember once spending a very productive hour or so with a group of women by the lakeside in Lake Malawi who were waiting for their husbands to return with the fish. And they were clearly women who understood uh, the market understood also what it was to be poor. And what they said to me was that the big issue for them was getting the fish to markets. They couldn't get it into the big towns. They couldn't get it into the cities. So what's World Fish's view about transportation and transportation policy, the cold chain, food processing? What's your view too uh, about aquaculture and fish health. These are the two things that particularly concern Aureli and Maureen. Okay, so if I should um, talk about the first. So if, as, as we know in Africa, there is a lot of regional trade between countries with respect to fish. And that fish that's traded regionally is mainly dried fish, and smoked fish because they're the infrastructure with respect to refrigeration, with respect to transportation just doesn't exist. So if you would go to, um, if I would give an example from um, Bangladesh where fish production took off in the 60s through, through small scale aquaculture. At the same time, there was a lot of infrastructure built into the system with respect to roads, with, with respect to transportation, cool transportation, with respect to storage facilities at markets. So there are all these things, many of these factors are at a very low level 
in many of the African countries. And unless we have these supporting supporting systems and supporting structures it's a, it's going it's difficult because fish is extremely perishable but see how um countries and at global level we have been able to overcome the difficulties with respect to milk you can get milk powder anywhere in the world uh, so th this is why in my presentation i've focused quite a lot on fish powder as a convenient, easy to use, ready to eat product, which can be which can be transported. But of course, it should not stop there because the key to nutritious diets is diversity. And we should not be con all concentrated on one product. We should be able to have systems that can allow populations to have a diversity of aquatic foods. Then you asked me about aquaculture and... Um, aquaculture and fish health, but we'll return to that if we okay. may in the general conversation afterwards. Thank you very much indeed for that, Dr. Thilstead. Dr. Thilstead mentioned in her presentation uh, the importance of involving uh, women uh, in uh, this uh, area. And we, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Njuki, Dr. Jemima Njuki, who, of course, uh, currently heads the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Lever for the UN Food Systems Summit and is one of 60 named champions for food systems. She's Africa Director at the International Food Policy Research Institute based in, in Nairobi. So we look forward very much uh, to your presentation, Dr. Njuki. Jemima, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul, and good evening, everyone from um, Nairobi. Um, I'm not going to be projecting slides. I have a cup, some notes here that I'll refer to. Um, I actually think I speak better without a PowerPoint. So, um, so I'm going to talk about gender and 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 food systems. And as um, Shukantala has has said, even as you looked at what she presented as the framework uh, for food systems, that one of the key drivers is, is gender and social inclusion, but that also one of the key uh, populations that we are concerned about is the population of, of women, adolescent girls. Um, we are also seeing nutritional issues around adolescent boys um, as well. Um, and so I wanna make those links between gender equality and food systems and talk about some of the priorities that we should actually be, uh, be thinking about and the evidence that exists for some of these priorities. Um, but just to, to set the scene for us, um, of course we know, uh, and even from global comparisons done by IFPRI and the World Bank from as far back as 2005, that there are strong correlations between hunger and gender inequality. And there are various ways in which the empowerment of women and girls and gender equality um, itself intersects uh, with, with food systems. And, and these intersections actually provide us with key opportunities uh, for transforming food systems in equitable ways. So first, we know, and, and I don't want to belabor some of these points because they'll be known to a lot of us that women are key actors in food systems. Their role is critical throughout uh, agricultural value chains from production. We see in Africa, they're providing more than 50% of labor in some countries. Um, growing on family plots. Uh, they are engaged in, in, in food preparation in a lot of ways. We say they are mediators for food and nutrition security of households. 
Uh, they're engaged uh, with distribution of food as traders in markets, as processors of food, and even as workers in, in agricultural firms. Uh, but we also know that their roles in general are undervalued and constrained by various limitations, whether it's their access to resources, services, uh, labor market um, opportunities. And this, this documented evidence of this unequal access to resources, including land, seeds, fertilizers, mechanization services, and, uh, and, and extension. And what these limitations do is they reduce their potential uh, to, to be productive. Um, within the, the formal employment sector, uh, and especially their work in, in agriculture, they are overrepresented in seasonal part-time and low-wage work. And the informal sector actually constitutes their primary source of, of, of employment. Um, and very often market institutions and governance models are quite uh, gender blind. I know things are changing, but not um, first enough. And these are imposing constraints to women's participation and benefits um, from, from markets. Within households, uh, we know uh, women's own food security and nutrition needs, and often those of girls and adolescents can often be neglected, either due to discriminatory social and, and, and cultural norms when the shortages of food, very often mothers will be last um, uh, to eat. And then we have much more recent evidence that is actually showing us uh, where we need to go. Yeah? That women's empowerment is a critical pathway to improved nutrition. So for example, we are seeing positive links between women's empowerment and child and maternal health. Um, our recent work at IFPRI using the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index is showing that in various countries, there's strong correlation between different indicators of women's empowerment, um, productivity, and, and nutrition. And then to the current debates we now have about transforming uh, food systems and the idea here is that we need to place emphasis on a combination of approaches, a combination of interventions, improved knowledge, sound policies, regulations, and investments across that whole framework that Dr. Shakuntala uh, presented to us. And so we're arguing that transforming food systems is not just going to be transforming them so that they are sustainable, so that we are able to produce and feed the world within our planetary boundaries and have adequate livelihoods for people. But we, we must also transform food systems in a just and equitable way. And to do this, we need to reframe our focus on gender equality and women's empowerment. Very often we ask ourselves, what are women's contributions in agriculture, food and nutrition security? And we have a lot of evidence of, of what their contributions are and what the key gaps and constraints are. And now we must ask how food and agricultural systems must be transformed so that they can contribute to the process of women's empowerment. And I want to highlight just five key priority areas that we know there is evidence that they work, they need to be scaled, and they need to be applied and implemented in much more intentional, uh, intentional ways. First is securing women's right to land. Yeah, women's access to use of and control of land and other productive resources are essential to ensuring their right to equality and to an adequate standard of living. Now, if pre-research has shown that when women have stronger rights and more access to land and productive resources, their crop yields increase. Yeah. Secure land rights also lead to greater in incentives to invest in the land, which creates economic opportunities and leads to more sustainable farming uh, practices. 
Women's land ownership is also correlated with higher incomes, including income generated from renting the land to others. Their own greater decision-making power within households, better child nutrition and improved educational attainment, especially for girls. We've seen approaches that work across uh, the continent. In Ethiopia, registering land in the name of men and women has been shown to increase investments um, in the land and actually to increase decision making uh, by women. We've seen efforts on creating awareness of uh, women's land rights um, has also worked. Legal reforms uh, that guarantee women's access to inherit and inheritance rights. We have seen that in, uh, in Kenya with the constitution, but also changing cultural norms because a lot of land in the continent is still owned under customary law. And changing the cultures, the practices, the norms and beliefs around women's ownership of land can lead uh, to increase in their, in their, or to changes in their rights. But this research has also shown that strengthening women's land rights can also disrupt existing power balances. Men, some men, for example, may view stronger women's land rights as a threat to their authority and it could lead to gender-based uh, violence uh, if there is perceived loss of control. And therefore, interventions that engage entire communities that include men, boys, and traditional leaders to ensure that the benefits of women's land rights to the entire community are understood by all have been shown to work. And these are some of the initiatives that we must scale across the continent. The second priority um, uh, that we are pursuing and that has been shown to work is the economic empowerment of women in the food system. A recent systematic review showed the barriers to women's economic empowerment in low and middle income countries, and especially in higher productivity sectors such as commercial uh, agriculture. And some of these constraints include lack of networks, infrastructure, credit, technology, gender norms and gender based uh, discrimination, but also laws restricting women's access um, to resources. Now, a lot of interventions interventions in, in these areas and from a lot of our IFPRI reviews, we've seen that at government level, a lot of these have been confined to creating funds to support women entrepreneurs or starting training programs um, for women. For private sector, linking women to value chains or diversifying the, their supplier bases so that they can include, in, include women. Contract firming uh, schemes. Um, diversity in, 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 the work, in the workforce. We've seen a lot of microfinance programs and there's a lot of evidence that show the extent to which these all work or don't work for women's, um, for women's empowerment. Too we have a lot of civil society organizations that are organizing women into cooperatives. But we want to be much more intentional and systemic in this change. For example, by transforming how finance is, is, is provided so that we have a gender transformative design delivery um, and assessment of the impact of, of financial, financial inclusion. The third element is addressing women's unpaid care and agricultural labor burden. And we know that there's a disproportionate um, allocation um, of, of labor. We have data, for example, that shows in Ethiopia, women are spending 90 to 105 hours per week of unpaid care work compared to men's nine hours. And this needs to be recognized, reduced and redistributed because it has an implication in terms of the kinds of economic activities that women can engage in, can be engaged in. If you give me just four minutes. Uh, I'm, afraid I, I'm afraid I can't, I can only give you two minutes. Okay. Um, the fourth priority is women's voice and decision making and leadership in the in the food system. 
And the fifth is access to technologies, including digital technologies. I think as technologies transform, we have to make sure that we do not leave uh, women, uh, women behind. And of course, all this must be anchored in, in policies, agriculture and food system policies that actually recognize the roles, contributions um, of women, but that are also uh, um, recognizing the need uh, and the links between women's empowerment and 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 gender and and uh, food and nutrition security. I would like to propose to close by saying that the focus on gender equality and women's empowerment must consider these multiple roles that women play in the food system as producers, entrepreneurs, leaders, and consumers, and how their decision making and control over resources can enhance their their their, their empowerment. So the analysis and action must take an intersectional approach as well, understanding the different identities of women will compound their marginalization in the food system. So for example, indigenous women might face greater barriers in participating in and benefiting uh, and engaging in different aspects of the food system. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And can I ask you one question that's coming up on the chat line? Um, and that is this, control over income and control over investment for women. Women controlled small businesses, women's role in, in agribusiness. Any thoughts on the success or otherwise of the Canadian initiative on gender lens, uh, gender lens focus investment in terms of development policy? Um, so the... I'll respond first to the uh, the household one in terms of control mm. over, over income. We know, for example, that the work on markets already shows that depending on how you develop markets, um, if you have markets, for example, that are closer to homes, that the likelihood that women will participate in these uh, markets, that if infrastructure is taken all the way down to rural areas, the women are much more likely to have the control over income from these uh, from these types of markets. So we have to also start investing in much more in in rural areas, developing markets in those in those areas. But we also must uh, address the gender and social norms um, within within households by engaging men and and. You know, making sure that there's an understanding that women's control over income is beneficial to them, but also beneficial uh, to households um, as well. Um, at, uh, at, at a global level and country level, we've actually seen that gender lens investing has meant more investment in women-led businesses because they face different constraints from uh, male-led businesses, issues of, of time. And for a long time, we've thought of women's businesses as, as micro. And so we're pushing them towards microfinance. But we... The, the idea is that they should benefit from equity funds. They should benefit from money markets. And this is going to require intentional investing in those women-led businesses. Thank you very much indeed. And I think we need to take that last message about intentional policy making. Yeah. If it's not focused, if it isn't intentional, it's not actually going to make a difference. Thank you for that extremely helpful presentation. Uh, we now turn to Matthew Wyatt, Director of uh, Humanitarian Security and Migration Division in the newly formed UK Foreign and Commonwealth Development uh, Office. Uh, we've only got him for 15 minutes and we want to make the most use of his time. Thank you, Matthew, for being uh, with us. We're delighted that uh, the Secretary of State made uh, an important and significant visit uh, to uh, Africa just, uh, just recently, and we look forward very much to hearing what you're going to share with us. Over to you, Matthew. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks so much for the invitation to attend today. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with colleagues from NRI on a very wide range of issues. And I never fail to be impressed by the knowledge, commitment and, pers and professionalism that they have. And in fact, one of my earliest career memories is of working with colleagues in NRI's predecessor, on uh, desert locust infestations in Eastern Africa. Uh, so kind of there's a bit of a feeling of deja vu in these current days. 
uh, I'm afraid. Um, I also have really enjoyed these great presentations and uh, just been chatting to uh, Du Mercy Lundo from K Kakuma Refugee Camp in the chat. So it's a great, great uh, event that you've organized. So thank you. So as the humanitarian and, and uh, migration director at FCDO, I've been asked, I think, to say something about our approach to humanitarian issues and famine prevention. But I will also say something about our longer term approach to food to security and nutrition as well, if that's OK. And I'll start by saying that even while overall poverty rates were falling over recent years, humanitarian needs have been rising. Fueled by protracted con con conflicts in the Middle East and across Africa, from DRC to Sudan and South Sudan, and from the Sahel to Somalia. Climate change is increasingly the uh, exacerbating factor. And last year, we saw the devastating impact of, if you like, a third C to add to conflict and climate change, which was COVID-19. And the secondary impacts of COVID-19 have fueled a reversal in poverty re reduction, destroyed and imperiled livelihoods, and increased the vulnerability of poor people, and even of those who may not have been very poor beforehand, increased their vulnerability to hunger and even to famine. And of course, even those three Cs are an oversimplification in a year that we see Africa again facing the threat of severe locust infestation and a, like, and a likely La Nina climate uh, event. I want to mention just three numbers to start with to illustrate my broader point. First, FAO estimates that there were something like 678 million undernourished people in the world in 2019, and that that's set to grow. Secondly, the UN estimates that this year there'll be a record 235 million people needing humanitarian assistance across 56 countries, and many of those live in Africa with, with very uh, deep crises in several countries. And the third number I want to give is 40%. That is roughly the proportion of UN appeals that actually, humanitarian appeals that actually get funded. So you've got rising numbers of people in need and a squeeze on donor funding. Um, and so the risks of acute suffering and famine are really real. So just to dive into a bit more detail at the more acute end of the spectrum, the International Food Security Phase Classification estimated at the end of 2020 that there were about 148 million people in a crisis, emergency, or catastrophe level of food insecurity, IPC levels three to five in the jargon. And they project that that could increase to 165 million by the middle of this year. And even for those at the lowest level, so-called crisis level, it means families um, skipping meals, selling important livelihood assets, and being unable to afford basic healthcare and schooling. And for the estimated 31 million people at the emergency level, that's even worse. As many of you will know, the threshold for calling a famine is really high, with 20% of households having extreme food gaps, at least 30% of children acutely malnourished, and a crude death rate of 2 per 10,000 per day. So it's really sobering that we've got reports that there are people in Yemen and South Sudan living in famine-like conditions already. So we are very worried. Famines have become very rare in recent years, and we know that they're present preventable. So a famine in 2021 anywhere would not only be an unspeakable tragedy, but also a huge collective global failure. And it was this that led the Foreign Secretary to mark the creation of FCDO from the merger of the old DFID and the old Foreign and Commonwealth Office by launching his call to action to prevent famine. And this involved the UK leading from the front. He pledged an additional 166 million pounds for more than 7 million vulnerable people in some of the world's most dangerous places. It involved a call for others to step up too, which is a really important thing. And the appointment of Nick Dyer as his special envoy for famine prevention and humanitarian issues. And this, uh, this um, initiative is focusing mainly on 11 countries where most of the 31 million people at greatest risk are living, and eight of those countries are in Africa. And what we're trying to do is to address the problem on two key fronts. The first one is money. It's mobilizing funding at a time when all donors, including ourselves, are facing big fiscal challenges, and when we know that 10 donors are providing over 80% of all global humanitarian funding, with us as the third largest donor. So a key role of the special envoy is to make the case for others to come in too with the funding that's necessary and to get the international financial institutions like the World Bank to make sure they're releasing funding in the right ways and targeting the right people. 
Second phase of the initiative is more political, and I won't say a huge amount about it, but essentially what it aims to do is to increase respect for international humanitarian law, improve the protection of civilians in conflict, and ensure that there's human humanitarian access to those in need. Because too often in conflicts, all these things are un under, real, under real stress. So we're taking various diplomatic initiatives at country level and internationally uh, to try and promote the respect of the humanitarian law. And of course, in doing so, we recognize that conflict by its very nature limits people's freedom of movement and access to livelihoods and markets and is really impacting on the production, processing, storage and supply of food, thereby undermining food security and nutrition, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. So wider efforts that we're making to try and help and address and resolve long running conflicts are also a really key tool in our efforts to reduce humanitarian need and to support livelihoods. So if the first thing was conflict, second one was climate change. Although it's difficult to attribute particular events to climate change, it's really clear that climate and conflict dynamics can interact in a vicious circle with each of them exacerbating the other. And the current events, for example, in Pibor country in South Sudan, county in South Sudan are a good example of that. Uh, it's an area long plagued by intercommunal violence linked to a wider conflict, which has undermined livelihoods and increased people's vulnerability. And then you get that compounded with rainfall and flooding in Jonglai State in 2020, leaving people trapped and unable to access food, uh, nutrition and health services and so on. And it's those sort of places where very, very sadly, we're seeing famine-like conditions beginning to occur. I'll come back to climate change in just a moment. Just wanted a quick word on the third C, COVID-19, which has really intensified the bleak food security situation in Africa, as the control methods have impacted on people's livelihoods and their ability to access basic foods and medicines, disrupted markets, created loss of income and so on. And it particularly exposes, it affects those who are already exposed to critical food, poverty and dietary deprivations beforehand. I think the creation of FCDO, and you, you mentioned this, Paul, at the beginning, uh, as a new department, is giving us a unique opportunity to try and pull together our diplomatic and political leverage with humanitarian expertise and age and, and aid. Because we know that conflicts need political solutions, and while they continue, diplomatic pressure is really, really important. So in concert with that kind of enabling environment, humanitarian assistance as the ultimate safety net is going to continue to remain critical. So I'm conscious I've spoken mainly, and I'll, I'll wrap up uh, in just a few moments, but I've spoken mainly about the extreme humanitarian risks in some of that action. Uh, and I think well, that's right, given the real risks that we've got of, uh, of, of famine in several countries. But of course, we know that short term action won't be enough to deliver sustainable solutions that address the underlying drivers and we need to lay the basis for long-term food security, good nutrition, and the prosperity that is the best insurance against such shocks. I think this year is gonna be a really important year for the UK in, in trying to help do this. In February, we're hosting the Security Council Presidency at the UN. In the summer, we'll be hosting the G7 uh, leaders. And in the winter in Glasgow, we have the Climate COP. And of course, the Secretary General will also be hosting his food summit later in the year. So there's lots of opportunities to address issues and build resilience to vulnerabilities and shocks and to help us to act before humanitarian crises strikes. And that's really my last big point, I think, in this is the importance that acting quickly and building resilience and is absolutely critical because prevention has always got to be better than cure. Too often, though, that's not the case. So despite the wealth of evidence that you need to invest in disaster production and anticipatory uh, action, too often it's only after crisis hits that we get the political will and the money to respond. So we're doing a lot to address that. I haven't got time to go into all the details now, but we have a number of, uh, a number of different interventions on both anticipatory action to release funding, spot crises before they happen and respond, but also building the longer term res resilience. And just three kind of ways in which we're trying to do that. Um, first of all, we've got a broad portfolio of agriculture programs and projects, some of them with NRI, of course, that we're trying to adapt into the new context. 
Secondly, we're putting a lot of effort into trying to strengthen global food security monitoring and analysis to better understand the mid to long term impacts of COVID-19 on food security, nutrition and livelihoods in Africa. And then thirdly, and more broadly, we're going to continue to engage internationally, including in the Food Systems Summit um, and, of course, in the, uh, in the Climate COP um, as we, in, in Glasgow. Uh, at the end of the year, and I'd be happy to say a little bit more about that uh, if we've got if we've got time, and about what we're hoping to achieve from some of those things. But for now, let me just conclude by saying that we know that humanitarian action can only be a band aid. Uh, it's one that's getting increasingly stretched thinly and threatens to snap. And if we're going to ensure that people everywhere have got access to enough safe and nutritious food and achieve SDG two, we're going to have to underline all the underlying drivers including conflict and climate change, and foster an environment where we can really make sure a green recovery takes place. And centres of excellence like NRI will have an incredibly important role to play. I will stop there. I did want to talk about gender, but I think Dr Njuki said everything I could have said far, far better. So I will stop there and very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that uh, presentation, Matthew, and the passion and dynamism you bring to uh, this area. Um, can I return you to your roots? We've got a, a question coming up uh, in the chat uh, line around locus control as being an example of prevention uh, being better than, than cure. So some thoughts about what we can do to build capacity to control uh, that sort of, of threat and the role within that, and indeed generally in terms of climate change, uh, crop resilience and the like of agricultural research institutes. I mean, we've got a number of se serious uh, players uh, uh, in that area uh, on the line. And I think the reality is that all too often, actually, uh, African governments, uh, finance ministers under pressure uh, as they all are currently with the debt crisis and so on, they don't see investment in agricultural research as being a priority for them. What can be done to improve capacity building and the flow of uh, support for agricultural research institutes? Right, okay, well, I'll have a crack. I mean, they're, they're really, really tough questions, but I will uh, I'll do my best to offer just some, some reflections. I mean, uh, I think, yes, the, the, the point on locus control, I think you're right. It, uh, the, the questioner is absolutely right, um, uh, Tim, that, that uh, prevention is better than, than cure. And I guess that goes to the heart of a couple of things, really, because, I mean, of course, we know that, you know, climate impacts can have an effect on, on breeding and so on. But perhaps even more importantly, um, much of the breeding of the, of, of the, of the locus control, the, of the locusts that have uh, led to the current infestation, much of that, of course, happens in Yemen. And what's happening in Yemen? A terrible, terrible conflict and very, very hard to access, very hard to access people with humanitarian aid, but also very, very hard to do any kind of locus control there. And, you know, organizations like FAO and we ourselves have been doing our very best to use, I mentioned in my presentation, diplomatic and political initiatives, mm. try to ensure that one can attack, uh, attack this problem at its roots because by the time the locusts have got in, into Eastern Africa, where of course they also continue to breed, in a sense, and not only Eastern Africa, elsewhere as well, in a sense it's too late. So I think addressing the root causes does involve um, that broader range of instruments, including political and diplomatic ones, as well as uh, scientific ones. Um, I mean, we have a very close partnership with FAO, which leads internationally on a lot of the work on, on locus control. And Dominic, Dominic Bourgeois, in fact, uh, went to, to Yemen not so many months ago to try to address that and has spent a lot of time in Eastern Africa. But I think it's right that the, the key to addressing these issues is local capacity and boosting local capacity. Um, and... Uh, and as you say, the difficulty, not only with scientific research, but also with locus control too, is, um, you know, governments are facing, you know, many, 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 many claims on their resources. And uh, it's often difficult for them to allocate the resources themselves to do this. And that's 
you know, one of the reasons why we have to kind of have a, a three-pronged approach, I suppose, is we need to have a dialogue with governments to try to make sure that that's understood and that they're working together, because of course, this is a regional problem that can't be addressed by any one country. And we have to, we have to where we can, provide technical support and so on, either directly through institutions that we have and, or through international institutions um, like FAO. And then we have to look in, in particular cases to see how we can best build local capacity, whether that's government capacity or within institutions. Um, but, you know, the fact, as I said at the beginning, that, um, you know, I began my career uh, working on a programme on locust control and we're still here, shows how hard it is. On science, and just very quickly, because I spoke too long really perhaps on the locusts, um, absolutely scientific research, absolutely critical and fantastic. We've got so many terrific institutions, including your own um, in the UK that can do this work. It's also really, really important that uh, the institutions overseas are uh, able to do this work as well. Uh, and partnerships, I think um, international partnerships are really, really important. The CGIAR network, of course, is also uh, incredibly important uh, in, in, that, in, that, in, that, in that respect. Um, I think one thing we've tried to do in what was DFID, but now in FCDO, is to really prioritize um, and understand the value of research and science, and then making sure that we're bringing through scientific and research discoveries into policy making and that certainly will be one of the things we'll be trying to do within FCDO and of course the Foreign Secretary in fact when he was in um, Kenya yesterday or the day before I think he went to Kemri one of the important institutions in, uh, in Nairobi. So science absolutely critical and just one sorry to indulge me just for one second but you know we've seen this terrible hurricane hit Mozambique just south of Beira recently um, one of the things that is helping to kind of make sure that the response is effective has been modelling that's been done by a number of British universities, Reading and Bristol have been involved in that. That's being used by the UN, by the Mozambican authorities to model and predict where the flooding is most likely to hit and take preventive action. So that's a really good example of science in action, perhaps not in the long term uh, livelihood uh, area, but nonetheless a very important one. Let me stop there anyway. No, thank you very much indeed. One question before you go, country specific. The Cameroon, 300,000 internally displaced persons. Uh, the World Food Programme working there, deeply concerned uh, uh, about uh, food security and hunger. Uh, an opportunity for the newly developed, uh, newly created Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, because clearly it requires both a humanitarian and a diplomatic response. Well, I certainly agree with the last point there. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I, I have to confess that I'm not a country expert on, on Cameroon, but you're absolutely right. The humanitarian situation there and the uh, conflict dynamics in there are, there are very, very worrying. Um, and of course, at the moment, there's also the question of funding for humanitarian operations across, across the piece. Cameroon has tended to be rather underfunded. One of the things that we do in FCDO is we do provide core funding to the UN agencies like WFP, and we provide core funding to the, uh, to the fund uh, which is run by OCHA, the uh, SURF, the Central Emergency Relief Fund, which is able to kind of put resources where they're needed, even in countries where we may not have uh, bilateral programs ourselves. So I think that kind of core funding and pool funding is really important for prices such as Cameroon or the Central African Republic that don't attract as much resources as, as some others do and help ensure that, that it gets there. But no, I think you're, you're absolutely right. One needs to have a, a, a combination of addressing the immediate humanitarian problems, but also trying to do to take diplomatic and political initiatives to try and bring an end to, or alleviate in the short term and bring an end in the longer term to the conflicts. Matthew, thank you very much indeed for the time you've given us today. We understand Thank you're you. very busy. Fantastic. Good luck in all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We now uh, turn uh, to uh, Professor Brown, Molly Brown, Professor of Food-Based Strategies for Nutrition at the uh, NRI, uh, doing some very exciting interdis interdisciplinary research work in relation to the use of satellites, remote sensing data and models uh, for social and economic demographic information to better understand the drivers of uh, food security. 
She's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences Committee on Earth Sciences and Applications from Space. So Molly, we're looking forward enormously to your contribution this afternoon. Over to you. Thank you very much. And I am sharing my screen. Thank you for, can you all see it, Paul? Can you see it? I can see it very well. Thank you. Molly. Okay, excellent. So just to follow on uh, with uh, the previous, um, let's see if I can move it forward. Yes. Yeah. So I love this idea about having um, really anticipatory action and being able to anticipate what's going to happen in the future and to, to get that large humanitarian effort and diplomatic um, uh, paraphernalia, get everyone together moving in the right direction. Part of this is getting the right data for the right aspects. So we all know that food security has three has four important aspects availability, access, utilization, and the stability of these. And we can use satellite remote sensing and weather data to look at variations in crop area and crop health to understand how drought might impact production in a particular place and how that will then affect distribution and exchange within a household. But we also, there's huge innovations going on right now looking at access as well not only of the affordability of, of food, but also the allocation and the preference, the income um, of households. And I'll give some examples of that. And finally, the utilization of food. Uh, see, why, yes. So the well, mobile phones now are being used to ask about an individual's experience of hunger whether or not their experience is, is their food safe, what's the social value of the food they have access to. So all of these um, new aspects of information can be brought together to make sure that we can reduce the amount of time it takes to respond to crises when they occur and to make sure we have anticipatory action. So remote sensing, you may all not know about what remote sensing can tell us, and basically it can see from space, rainfall, clouds, soil moisture, floods, the direct impact of floods. This is a movie that shows the dynamics of the season that we can see from space and that we can um, model and, and look at directly using observations. So the observations of food availability can be used to estimate directly agricultural production. The three major data sets that are used today in, within food security analysis are the vegetation greenness, which is often MODIS vegetation index, normalized difference vegetation index, or um, Landsat and Sentinel as well are really common vegetation sensors. The data is available daily or every 16 days and has been around um, for several, for three decades now since, or actually four decades, but MODIS data has been available since 2000. There's also um, five kilometer resolution precipitation data and also temperature data, maximum temperature data. These new data sets are extraordinarily accurate and available globally around the world so that we can use them to understand what's happening. However, um, we have uh, rainfall and, um, pardon me, so we can use this information to track critical thresholds related to hydrometeorological extreme events like that hurricane that we saw that we were discussing earlier in order to know what the impact of that hydrological event is, has on food security, you need to know what are the local coping capacities? What, is there food stored? Is it affordable for the local community affected by this event? What's the poverty level? What is the production right now and in the future likely to be? Are there waterborne and vectorial diseases at play that will affect um, utilization of food? What is the access to affordable health care? All of these things need to be brought together in a socioeconomic analysis in order to understand how um, 
that this might change livelihoods. So I'm going to give you some examples now. Here's some, an example of how the Famine Early Warning Systems Network in the United States uses satellite data. This is from the last ten, first 10 days of January of this month, showing the um, East African Vegetation Index. There's been a drought going on in Kenya and in Yemen and in Ethiopia yet again, unfortunately. Um, the Moisture Index, this is a new product available, um, which shows uh, the same sort of regional pattern. And finally, hopefully we can see the last one. Come on, let's see, um, there. And you can see the, uh, a seasonal accumulated rainfall by Pentad. This, these data sets are comprehensive and can be used to drive direct observations of food availability. So it's one thing to see hydrological extremes, it's something else to see the actual production on, at the ground. And as we know, agricultural production is yield times area. Yield is estimated um, to be the greenness or the rainfall correlated with the yield. And so you can then derive using observations from space, the amount of the, the productivity per hectare or per region on the ground. And when you couple that with cropped area estimates, which lets you see how much area is in cultivation, you can combine these two estimates together to understand total production. And here's another set of estimations for millet. So although you need to have really high quality yield information, a lot of work has been gone into transforming observations into yield directly. So what do global decision makers use these kinds of remote sensing derived products? And I can tell you a map is worth a thousand words, right? So uh, frankly, observations of from satellites are used extensively, not only at the community and local level, but also internationally, private sector, um, uh, national companies, regional companies, governments and non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations like ECOWAS and the African Union, uh, uh, the national level uh, private, uh, international inter institutions, you name it, they're using it. So I do think that there's a lot of ex uh, a lot of availability of production. So the question is then, what about the other aspects of food security? So food access is also being a really um, become super important, particularly in that the third C, we have conflict, climate, and COVID. Right, so the third C, now that we have COVID, food, uh, price, food prices and the income of households is, is very, becoming extremely variable. So obviously we've had price data of food prices available through AMIS, the Agricultural Market Information System for decades now. That, those data sets are available online for use. They are typically three or four cities in every country. And the question is, how does the income of vulnerable households, are, how are they affected by events? And how does the income um, relate to the price of food? And we can see from this figure there in the center that um, in Africa, the food prices in Sub-Saharan Africa are 30 to 40% higher than prices at the rest of the world at comparable levels of per capita income. This is really important because it means that when you see a small variation in prices without a consummate change or increase in income, you likely to see much higher levels of food insecurity. So, to, act, to determine how uh, income varies, there's been a big push in the last year, frankly, is to use mobile phones, mobile devices to call people and ask them how their um, income has changed. So you're seeing now a map at the center of the screen 
which shows this World Bank product where they have surveyed households that, uh, and asking them directly, how is their income changed as a source of livelihood in the last 12 months? These data sets are now being updated every week. It's an extraordinary development. Now, not only do we have changes in food prices, but we now can combine that with changes in income directly. It's called the Rapid Monitoring Database, and it allows to combine survey rounds every four to six weeks, um, income on uh, information on income. Similarly, for utilization. So for diet diversity, we can, uh, this uh, goes back to the first speaker of the day that show, talked about what people are eating. And so you have this minimum dietary diversity score, which has been uh, collected as a population level indicator by the World Health Organization. And this shows indicators of that where you ask people through dietary recall over the past 24 hours, how many food groups a particular, the, the youngest child in their household has consumed. So, and you can see in that blue box, the, the food groups, breast milk, grains, legumes, dairy products, uh, meat and fish at number five, eggs, vitamin A rich foods and other fruits and vegetables. This is not a perfect indicator of dietary diversity because it does not provide any information about minimum consumed amount, total nutrient content, or information on food safety. But it does give us a piece of information about how many, um, how many food groups people are able to consume food from. So this is uh, an example from 2005 to 2009, there was over 107,000 children across 19 low and middle income countries that the dietary diversity score showing that in Africa, that you see the lowest diversity, whereas in South, South America, you see the highest dietary diversity. And this is from a paper just came out um, in environmental research letters. So, we can then use these kinds of approaches to look at the household hunger score directly. So I've been speaking about the different aspects of food security, availability, access, utilization. But if you go directly to household hunger score, you can ask about the, the in, uh, you can ask directly about questions about food security anxiety about household food supply, insufficient quality of food, or the consequences of insufficient food intake and the health of the individual. So the results of this survey is a scale that's comparable across space and time. And now that we have in 2021, we now have mobile food security assessments, which ask respondents to follow up with a phone survey, randomly call, or even, you know, random digit dialing. So now we have the World Food Program getting into phone, just literally they buy phone numbers and call people around the world to ask them about their food security in order to get the most, um, the most representative sample possible. What's really interesting about this is that this extent is going across all of Sub-Saharan Africa food um, and to get really comparable uh, and, and unique information which is available at the very, at temporally extremely rapidly. So this is my last slide and it gives you some example of this kinds of data from Kenya. And look at the trend in food and consumption patterns. Here's November 2020, and we have January 2021. Never before have we had access to this kind of information, which varies both in time and in space. And so we can really get at some of this early anticipatory action to try, instead of waiting for people to be malnourished, we can respond much more immediately to insufficient food 
consumption patterns to respond in a way which is not only appropriate, but also uh, targeted in space. So, and we can see here, and this has all been updated as of the 15th of January, 2021, incredibly changes in market access and food-based coping. And we can see the answers to the questions that we were posing previously, rely on less, and less expensive food, limit portion size, reduce the number of meals. So, and here are the responses um, from January 11th and January 4th. Now, there are a lot of weaknesses to these approaches because of course you can't survey people who don't have access to phones, but by using representative uh, approaches and combining these kinds of surveys with in-person surveys, we can continue to expand the amount of information available to assess food security through time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Molly, for a fascinating presentation. A, a number of questions. Let me uh, kick off about how you get information. I mean, I'm a I'm a, a, a woman cocoa farmer mm -hmm. wrestling in the eastern region of Ghana with the impact of climate change, where you can see on the ground when you get out into the farms. My cocoa prices have uh, dropped dramatically uh, because yep. of the decline uh, in prices that's accompanied uh, COVID. Why should I take a call from the World Food Programme? I mean, <laughs> where are the incentives that are applied to get, right. for people to give this information? Right. So uh, a lot of the good news is that the World Food Programme really recognizes this. So it's a two-way street. If you answer the phone, they can. there is a series of menu options, and you can ask them, where can I get help? Where can I get support? They can, you can find out about programs that the World Food Program is supporting in the area. Also, they're delivering tons of information about COVID and other health impacts. And so it is not just a, it's not just a pull, it's also a push of information. Mobile phones are incredible, right? Also, I would like you to know that they are using social media to a great extent. So, and it, that of course varies where you are. Some places, it's, some places it's Facebook, other places it's WhatsApp. So it's not, this does not imply payment of phone charges because they usually do this over WhatsApp. Actually, I forgot to mention that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I mean, I've got some industry specific uh, questions. Uh, the impact of climate change uh, on the uh, aqua and the fishery uh, sector. Uh, uh -huh. Undoubtedly, uh, flooding has an impact. Uh, uh, yes. If, if you're into aqu aquaculture, are you able, uh, with the data coming in from the satellites, to be industry specific in terms of its implications? Yes. So, you know, water. So what we can see is the temperature of the very top um, of the water body. And so we can see through time water temperatures, but what we cannot see is how deep the water is. And so you have stratification. It's a little bit complicated, but we also can see the changes in water quality through the land cover change surrounding the water body. So if you're in a lake, you can see if you've taken out all the forests in the, in the um, catchment, you will likely see a lot more contamination of changes in turbidity and amount of nutrients in the water. So there are a lot, you know, hydrology and geomorphology are a hundred year old sciences. And so right. there's extensive information about that. And Okeke asks, do you also consider the cultural food habits and available food types like cereals, legumes, roots, tubers, meat and fish in your calculation of food costs. And then they are, are, they are some questions too from um, Edika, uh, Rose, Rosemary, Rosemary Edika. Uh, 
about people in Africa, we don't tend to measure, uh, weigh our food. Right. So how, right. how, how are you dealing with that? When sort it of comes it? to yield, yeah. When with it comes yield. to yield. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the pre, I certainly agree with that. But so on the previous discussion, yes, um, the food basket is a very critical part of analysis about food security. And it is quite complicated. I have a paper about this I can share. If any, I'll put it in the chat when I'm done Thank speaking. You. And then regarding yield, that is a gigantic problem. The fact that, you know, how many bags and all the bags have been cut down and they're all sewn is crazy. So that is a huge issue. And one which is being addressed by crop cuts and also more digital technology working to understand variations through time as opposed to absolute yield. Does that help? Yeah, that's, re okay. that's very helpful. And George it asks you about the criteria for estimating per capita food requirements in terms of nutrients. Because sometimes right. people are encouraged to consume certain types of food items because of their nutri nutritional and chemical Compositions, can you replace animal proteins with plant proteins, George asks. Um, that is uh, really beyond my expertise, I can tell you. But the, my point here is that you can amend the survey to be locally relevant uh -huh. and then comparable. So what I'm interested in doing is getting up to a scale where we can communicate with decision makers so action can happen. Right. Yes. So although the although these categories are they may fit the local circumstance less well in one place, what we want to do is to try to scale up so that we don't leave people out. Of the Thank you. We will we'll come to the issue of communicating with decision makers in the more general discussions in a minute. But okay. thank you very much Great. indeed, Professor Brown, for that fascinating presentation. I, I now turn to. Uh, Professor Niccolo Lowe uh, from the University of Central Lancaster, Professor of Nutritional Sciences, Co-Director of, Inst of the International Institute of Nutritional Sciences and Food Safety. And we're looking forward uh, very much to uh, her, her presentations, uh, not least as she is uh, also the Food Systems Champion of the Global Grand Challenges Research Fund at UK Research and Innovation. Over to you, Professor Lowe. Nicola? Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you to Professor Andrew Westby for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, just to answer Paul's question at the very beginning, why, why are we here? Why am I here? Um, I'm here because Paul has asked me to share with you some of the impactful research that has been funded through the Global Challenges Research Fund, uh, one of the UKRI funding streams. And I'm going to share my screen with you now. I hope this works okay. So you can see my presentation. And put it on to full screen. I'm just hoping, oops, that that's, uh, that's clear. Hope, hope everybody can see this. Good, uh, nodding faces, that's good, good to see. Okay. Um, so yes, the title of my presentation is the Global Challenges Research Fund with the Food Systems Portfolio, the, invest the Investment and Impact in Africa. And I'm speaking as, uh, as, as the challenge leader for the Food Systems Portfolio. So as many of you will be well aware, the Global Challenges Research Fund or GCRF program as we refer to, was developed to address the global challenges and to stimulate disciplinary and interdisciplinary research. It was also designed to strengthen capacity for research, something we were talking about a little er earlier, and to facilitate innovation and knowledge exchange in developing countries and the UK through equitable partnerships. And it was also set up to provide an agile response to emergencies and opportunities. And that this has been highlighted very recently with the agile call that was launched in the beginning of the summer to uh, fund research related to, to helping uh, alleviate some of the consequences of COVID-19. 
So the fund uh, was uh, is a £1.4 billion investment of ODA uh, funds that has uh, been running for five years. It started in 2016 and will be finishing in 2021. And during this time, we have to date funded over 1,500 projects with over 800 low and middle income research and project, project partners. And this has been delivered through UKRI plus our delivery partners. So just to uh, show how these 1,500 projects have been organized, um, the, the different portfolios are shown in this wheel on the right-hand side, and the food systems portfolio is the one at, in, the, in the orangey red at the bottom. So we have six portfolios, including food systems, global health, uh, resili resilience to environmental shock, uh, uh, food security, et cetera. And overseeing each of these portfolios, we have the eight challenge leaders. The role of the challenge leaders uh, is to help deliver impact from these investments. And we also have a fund known as the GCRF Collective Programme, uh, which was a £147 million fund to help to enhance the overall impact of the six portfolios. And through this fund, we launched two research calls over the last couple of years, one focused on cultures, behaviours and histories of agriculture, food and nutrition. And the second was a combined food systems approach to developing in interventions to address the double burden of malnutrition. So that kind of gives a, an overview of the way those 1500 projects have been organised into the different portfolios. But focusing now in on the food systems portfolio, as this is the one most relevant to this meeting today, this slide shows where those funds have been distributed uh, and uh, the ge geographical locations of where those projects are being conducted. So the, um, the yellow circles, the size of the circle, um, represents the, the total funds awarded to each part of the globe. And the shading of the country illustrates the number of projects that have been funded in each of those geographical locations with the darker funding, uh, uh, shading indicating where uh, more projects are being held. But overall, it's true to say that over two thirds of the overall budget uh, within this portfolio is allocated uh, to, to partners and um, uh, project partners in Africa. This, um, uh, this, this word cloud um, shows the, the countries uh, where our projects are being conducted. And just to pull out the top five pro um, countries, uh, we have Kenya, where we have 38 projects currently uh, funded through the GCF program. We have Tanzania, where there are 30. South Africa, we have 23 projects. Ethiopia, we have 18. And in Malawi, we have 16 GCRF funded projects. You may be aware of the, uh, the interdisciplinary research hubs that have been supported through the GCRF program. A total of 12 global interdisciplinary hub hubs have been set up. And the purpose of these hubs are to enable researchers from all over the world to work together on a given research topic. They provide a forum for discussion, for sharing of best practice, and for promoting excellence in research management. This map shows the number of unique organizations that are partners in the 12 hubs, and the regions that they're based in. And I'd just like to showcase one of them that is relevant to our discussion today. And this is the Action Against Stunting Hub. I'd like to share some of the impacts that this uh, hub has already achieved, although it's, uh, it's still only partway into its uh, uh, five-year lifespan. So the, the hub has developed a, a model to understand the drivers of stunting from a whole child perspective. 
This includes epigenetics, the gut microbiome, home and food environments at the national level. The workshops have been planned with each country uh, to ensure that researchers and relevant stakeholders benefit from the outputs of this model. And clinical trials are underway in three different countries, in Indonesia, India, and Senegal, to investigate the impact of providing egg supplements on nutritional status and health and well-being. The hub and the all-party uh, parliamentary group for Africa joined forces to hold a high-level parliamentary roundtable on tracking the rise of, of child nutrition in Africa um, in the House's, House of Commons. Following from this event, Paul and Nathan MP, who chaired this session and sits on the International Development Committee, recommended that the committee hold an evidence session specifically on the impact of childhood stunting. A key outcome of this hub is capacity building and strengthening and developing key, key skills in the management of interdisciplinary research. So you can see that these hubs, uh, of which this is, is one of 12, can have a significant impact on, on uh, capacity building and on policy as they develop and go forward. UKRI have also uh, developed a strong partnership with the Africa Research Universities Alliance to address the sustainable development goals. This partnership supports, partnerships supports 13 uh, ARUA centers of excellence um, with up to 600,000 pounds each over three years to help build research capacity, as well as additional funds for projects focusing on food security, pollution, water management, conflict prevention, and peace building, and also the impacts of climate change. An example of this is the Food Security Centre of Excellence uh, that is hosted at the University of Pretoria. So overall, UKRI GCRF investments have engaged with researchers from over 40... <laughs> Please put yourself on. Please put yourself on mute so we can listen to Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. The heat map uh, on the right hand side shows the location of these centers of excellence. They're the orange dots and the level of the UKRI collaborations across Africa through this fund of which there are 670 collaborations in total. The size of the dot indicates the number of centers of excellence within that area and the shading, the darker the shading for the region indicates the number of unique organizations involved in that uh, center of excellence. I'd like to showcase one of the networking projects that has been funded through this scheme. This is it's called AFRICAP. Um, it was one of the first uh, networks that was funded through the GCRF, GCRF scheme. And it was developed to uh, utilize interdisciplinary research, to develop a new understanding of the African food system and to support climate smart, sustainable agriculture and development to inform policymakers. The future impact for this network includes modeling, as we've heard from our previous speaker, how, how powerful this tool can be. Modeling of the impact of extreme weather events on future yields to predict future conditions on nutrition, food security and greenhouse gas emissions and how this can be used to inform decision making. The AFRICAP program findings have contributed already to national consultations. And examples of these include the Comprehensive Afri African Agriculture Development Program or CAADP and participation in advisory committees, including the review of the IPCC Special Report on Climate Change and Land. This Africa network has also led to an additional network being created, the Food Systems Research Network for Africa, which was launched recently, again funded through UKRI uh, and 
uh, ARUA, the African Research Universities Alliance Partnership. And this new network operates in six sub-Saharan African countries, including Ghana, Malawi, South Africa, Tanzania, Zambia. And the aim of the network is to strengthen food systems research capabilities and tr translate this evidence into implementable policy solutions, which is absolutely key to uh, addressing the sustainable development goals. So you can see that the portfolio, the food systems portfolio from the GCF program has already in its in its four to five years of, of being uh, resulted in quite a significant impact on uh, sustainable development goals uh, around the world. Of course, excellent research is at the heart of what GCF funds and this will result in uh, publications and I think also equally importantly, not just about academic publications, it's also about uh, artistic and creative outputs, which are fundamental to communicating the research findings with the broader uh, audience. The, uh, the fund has also resulted in technical and software products, spin out companies, uh, research, research tools, and all kinds of additional outputs as well. I'd like to wrap up really by showcasing one more study that has been funded through this scheme. And this was funded through one of our small grant awards, a foundation award. Uh, uh, and the project is located in the Ethiopian Highlands. Esnet, uh, sorry, Enset is a traditional Ethiopian starchy crop. Uh, and the project was designed to investigate its food security and climate a smart potential. A key outcome of this is progress towards the establishment of an NSET center of an excellence in Ethiopia, led by uh, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian PAN organization. So I guess the next question which is on everybody's mind is that GCF program is coming to an end in, in 2021 and what does the future hold in terms of where we're going next with supporting this important research? Well, currently we're in a, in a little bit of a holding pattern. We're waiting the outcome of the spending review following the announcement of the reduction in the OD budget from 0.7 to 0.5% of GNI. We are focused on delivering the GCRF collective program and the COVID-19 Agile call that was uh, released last summer. We're continuing the development of partnerships recognized as critical, critical to achieve the maximum possible impact of the investments that have already been made through this fund. And we're also continuing to focus on and strengthen best practice in equitable partnerships, which is one of the major pillars of the GCRF program, along with gender equality. And we are continuing to collect our GCRF impact case studies to demonstrate the impact of this research fund uh, on the SDGs globally. So that's where I'd like to finish and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for that presentation, Professor Lowe. It was absolutely fascinating, very much on point. And I want now if we could, and uh, technical and coordinating colleagues will assist in this to go into the general discussion to begin with a question uh, for uh, you, Professor Lowe, but if we could make sure that all the other participants who remain with us are up on the screen because I want us now to, to broaden out the, the discussion. But clearly partnerships are very important in terms of taking forward uh, the uh, work on food, food and nutrition security. Tell us something about the, uh, the issues uh, you've faced in terms of building capacity, in terms of partnerships. Partnerships require a lot of work. They don't just mm -hmm. happen. Uh, tell us about the uh, Africa Research Universities Alliance and the work you're doing, you're doing there. And, how that came to be a meaningful partnership. 
I think that's a really important question and it applies not only at the high level of, of organizations working together, but it also comes all the way down to um, research, individual research teams and community members who are also part of that partnership. You're right, these things do not happen overnight. They take time and they take uh, investment in, in uh, building those uh, the, the, the trust, the trust between researchers and communities, and and it's, it is absolutely a fundamental. <laughs> Put your mute on, everybody, please. Thank you. And, and it's something that you know we, we strive very, very hard to achieve when awarding grants grants to to um, potential project um, researchers we ask them to demonstrate how the partnership is equitable how the partners have engaged with one another to develop the research question and how the partners the academic partners have engaged with the communities to help develop the research question so that the research is absolutely relevant to the in-country situation and to the concerns and challenges of the communities they are designed to, to, um, to alleviate the, the SDG challenges. So yes, it is um, an integral part of what we do. It's not easy to achieve, especially when uh, the partnership often is, is weighted towards those who hold the budget. But UKRI is working very hard to overcome some of those challenges and looking more towards funding principal investigators from our ELMIC country partners rather than the grant holders always being in the global, um, in the global north. I wonder if we can now, thank you very much for that, I wonder if we can now broaden out uh, the discussion around partnerships um, and perhaps we could look at this issue uh, of of gender in that regard. Capacity building uh, in uh, gender uh, transformative um, partnerships. How does, how does one go about that? What works, what's proved to be successful and what not, what's not so uh, successful? Jemima, would you like to kick off with that one? Um, yes, um, I think we need that this need for capacity building at different levels and and one has to start all the way from 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 the policy level. How do you make gender sensitive gender transformative uh, policies at that level because at some point really policies anchor implementation and especially when you're looking for action um, at country level. So it needs to start from there but by getting people to to have a good understanding of what we mean by transformation and what kinds of policies work for, for long-term sustainable transformation or change. Um, at the same time, the other kind of partnership that works very well is there are things that we know how to do very well in research in terms of collecting data, disaggregating data. And there's also things that the civil society has learned to do well over the years, you know, social, social change. And so the, we need to have some stronger partnerships between researchers and, and, and those in civil society and grassroots organizations. One of the things that Shakuntala presented was this work in, in Zambia that led to both reductions in post-harvest losses, but also changes in, in, in norms around women's roles in, in, in fisheries and, and management of, um, of fisheries equipment. And that was a partnership between Wildfish, the university, you know, Zambia Communications Program, which is a behavior change uh, civil society organization. So we have to broaden these partnerships beyond, you know, university to university to engage grassroots organizations, to engage civil society, and to make sure that policymakers actually understand the role of, of gender and what actually happens when you do not address gender and what do you gain by by addressing, uh, addressing gender. So we've got to get much better at, um, at, at that. 
and Thank and one of much. the other things I also always see is everybody asks me where can we get good gender experts, but very few people are training them. Gender experts like biologists, like economists, don't grow out of trees. So we also have to invest in training the next generation of gender researchers that, yeah. that can actually do this. I, that's a very important point. And we don't want to lose this issue of training the next generation, not least in any event as the farming population, the farmer population, is aging. Uh, it's not actually easy to attract young women and young men into agriculture. We have more success in attracting them into agribusiness. So this issue of next generation training is, is an important one, and I hope we'll be able to return, return to it. Uh, we, we've got an, an important point made by uh, a number of the uh, participants on the on the chat line um, uh, attention is drawn to sustainable development goal 12 responsible consumption and production um, I I wonder if you'd like uh, Shakuntala to to just address this issue uh, both in the gender context but more, more generally about promoting sustainable consumption and and production uh, and, and what we knew what we need to do to support food system transformation in building capacity in that area shakuntala thank you paul well This may sound lame, but one of the issues that we have, and especially in Africa compared to where I, the other countries where I work, for example, in Southeast Asia, is lack of data. Yeah. So if you, if you would ask me about how, how if working as a researcher and working with the young researchers that 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 I associate with in some of the African countries, if we were to, when we want to work with uh, making diets sustainable, making them equitable, looking at intra-household um, intra -household, food consumption it is a so seasonality of 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 food consumption what do households do when the main staple when the maize dries up mm. how then how do they move to root to roots tubers and bananas and then how do you how do you adjust the food system? How do you adjust the plate of foods? It's extremely difficult because of lack of data. So that is one big issue. I mean, I present, for example, the micronutrient um, composition of different fish species. If I, were, if I was doing that in, uh, in Asia compared to Africa, I think I have more, 100 times more mm that I can work with. So, so it's very difficult to give evidence-based suggestions and recommendations when we are working with diets, when we are working with food systems. And one of the issues that really bothers me, as I say, it's the seasonality. Because you, you would you may give recommendations, but it just doesn't fit because of these huge issues of seasonality and different foods within the systems that you have at different yeah. times. Yeah? And then again, the, um, the intra-household, uh, the, 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 all the intra-household issues. If I work in, in countries in Bangladesh, for example, in, in other Asian countries, I have intra-household data. I can talk about women's diets. I can talk about children's diets. I can talk about adolescents' 
adolescent diets. It's very difficult to do this in, in, in Africa. So, so this collaboration we have with Unities, this, I, I was very intrigued with all the um, collaboration and the alliances and the centers of excellence that are being built up in Africa. I do think that's essential for us to move forward. It will take time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. It's not lame at all. I don't, I think the response from the chat line is, it's certainly not lame. It, it's what I think Felicia calls it true talk. <laughs> it, 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 it's not lame at all. Uh, and then Abdullah, Abdullah comes in with the main problem is the lack of available data. Now, KK shares that, uh, you know, there, there's, a fact there is a problem around encouraging research collaboration, peer to peer research collaboration, uh, that people like to hoard uh, data and good practice to themselves. I have to tell you that's hoarding good practice. I can speak as a former chief secretary in the United Kingdom when we were trying to encourage people to share good practice and bad practice. Hoarding that to yourself is not a uniquely African problem. Yeah, so let's not beat ourselves up too much about that. But there is an issue around data. Uh, Molly, help us with that. I mean, you operate at a very high level, literally, <laughs> space. But I mean, you must have some general observations around data collection, data distribution, data sharing, the status of statistical offices uh, in Africa. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there's huge amounts. I, I am so with you about seasonal data. And frankly, satellite data, you know, we the first satellite was launched in 1978, a meteorological satellite. That's a long time ago. And, you know, people have been predicting the transformation of global blah, blah, with, because of satellite data. Never happened. It will never happen without local information to transform our bits and bytes into actual information, and then to deliver that information to people who can do something about it, right? So it's this whole chain of events. So the satellite data gives you information about what the plants are doing, but frankly, nobody cares about plants. What they wanna know is how the plants affect the livestock and then how the livestock and the plants mm. and the food affects the people and then how the health and the well-being of the people affect the economy and everything else everyone else is doing and how can we intervene in effective ways so for me my whole career has been about communication and engagement and application of satellite data in the into the community one other thing I would say is that there's huge efforts right now, like the Gates Foundation is funding this huge effort to gather information about uh, fields, right? So if mm -hmm. we could draw little, little borders around everybody's fields, little tiny fields, and then say, okay, this is a bean field in Uganda, and here's another bean field in Nigeria, and here's a bean field in Senegal, and how can we compare the remote sensing information across all those different fields in a way that's quantitative and compared to management? So which person's management does better? And, you know, can we get all those guys to work together in a network, in a network which where we can use a social media tool, right? What's up groups to get all those bean farmers together so that we can make real progress, which is south to south. I mean, we don't, up here, I mean, in the north, we don't know anything about growing beans in Nigeria, yeah. right? So let's get those guys working together to really accelerate development. And that's like real use of technology. Thank you very much uh, for that. I mean, clearly a call to think outside the box, uh, to be innovative, to take risks. We need a TikTok for agriculture. I've only just discovered TikTok, but I, I'm, I'm now, a, I'm now a, great, a great believer, thanks to my, my grandchildren. Now, uh, we've got to draw things to a, begin to draw things to a close. I, I want, however, before we do, just to address an issue uh, that has come up 
uh, I think it, it's uh, Dr. Dr. Wahab who actually talks about, yeah, Dr. Yes, it is Dr. Ab, uh, Wahab who, who talks about actually, we shouldn't forget the value of South-South collaboration. You know, what more can be done um, to encourage collaboration between South Asia uh, and, and Africa, looking at issues, whether it's around uh, aquaculture, uh, ag aqua agri-food farming systems. Uh, um, Nicola, uh, you're a, 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 the food systems champion for global, for the Global Grand Challenges Research Fund at uh, the UK Research and, uh, Research and Innovation. What's your sense about South-South cooperation? I mean, that's absolutely um, something that we would encourage within the GCRF program. And there are lessons that can be learned that, are, that, are sh that can be shared across South-South uh, uh, organizations. And um, yes, we seek to, to, to um, encourage that wherever we can in the projects that we support. So uh, yeah, absolutely. And do you see it happening? Is it, when you look at the global yes. picture, is it yes, happening more and what more yes, can we, we do. do to encourage we do. it? Yes, we do. Um, yeah, the GCF program has funded a number of network grants that specifically facilitate collaboration in, the, in South to South. So that is absolutely fundamental to, to part, of, part of what we're doing. Good, thank you very much indeed for that. And a big thank you uh, to all uh, our contributors this afternoon. So let's give them one of these. I'm a great believer in that. We may not be in the same room, but I want you to, to feel uh, our, our appreciation for your contributions. A big thank, thank you to uh, you all. Uh, we've had, you know, uh, more than uh, 150 people at various times on uh, this uh, particular call. Thank you for your contributions. There's one point I would make as we, as we go, go out. Uh, it came up earlier on, on the chat line, asking, you know, asking us at NRI, to make sure that this gets out there to African policymakers and African movers and shakers. I mean, I can promise you uh, that uh, Greenwich University, our NRI, does see ourselves as having a role in advocacy. Um, uh, Andrew and his colleagues uh, are absolutely committed to partnership with you in that, in world quality research, focused on the needs of, of your communities. Um, and we're just with you 100% on that. And we'll do all we can to get the product of this session and other sessions out there. But I want to share one thing with you as someone who spent their life um, uh, as an advocate, as an activist, uh, then as a cabinet member, a politician, a diplomat. You know, there's a lesson I've learned, and it's summed up by the words of, of a great uh, African-American, son of a slave, great activist at the turn of the century, it was in the 19th century, when, say, say the most photographed man in the 19th century, a guy called Frederick Douglass. And he said this, power, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Well, all of us on this call today are making a demand around the importance of food and nutrition security, putting that at the heart of development. It's so important that we talk to each other, share good practice, what works, what doesn't. But you know, it's nothing is more important too uh, over and above our own collaboration, the excellence of our research, nothing's more important than your communicating yourselves in your country with the policy makers in your country, involving the traditional leadership, involving the political leadership. Uh, you know, everybody is in this together, but we've got to recognize that governments are dealing with a whole heap of crises, a health crisis, they're dealing with a financial crisis. Uh, they're dealing with the drying up of remittances. They're dealing with the reduction in 
development funding. They're dealing with a whole heap of problems. And therefore, if we're to make this a priority, we have to push it up their agenda. And there's no substitute for that than your own activity on the ground. Seek alliances with local members of parliament. Reach out to the business sector. You know, all too often in academia, we see ourselves as separate from business, mm. separate from politics. We're not. Uh, agriculture demands multidisciplinary approach. It demands par partnerships. And I think if we can do one thing and take away one thing from this discussion, it's the importance of putting work into partnerships. But those local partnerships are absolutely crucial. Thank you for your activism. Thank you for your caring. Thank you for your the richness of your contributions today. And I'm going to hand over uh, to Andrew, our director, Professor Andrew Respi, to, to sum up and to uh, close us down. Okay, uh, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, you, know, I, you know, we really appreciate the, the support that you give us and you know, we really appreciate your wise words and the way that, you, that, that you've, uh, uh, you've, you've led this session. Um, I think it's really set us up well for this week. Um, you know, the rest of the week is really about partnership. Um, you know, uh, there are a number of uh, sessions happening in, in the rest of the week around those four theme areas. And we'll bring those together uh, towards the end of the week as well. And hopefully that will lead to expanded collaborations and new projects and uh, new initiatives moving forwards. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you to our presenters. You, you're all fantastic. You know, really appreciated everything that you've done. A uh, quick mention for our Vice Chancellor, Jane Harrington. I know she had to go off to another meeting, probably related to COVID, as everything seems to be related to COVID at the moment. Um, you know, we, we really appreciate the, the support that she gives us. And just a special mention for uh, the organising committee. Um, you know, it kind of all goes on in the background. You go running around and suddenly in two and a half hours, it's all gone. It's all happened, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but I'd just like to thank Tim and Adrian and Caroline, June, Marcus, Fiorella, John and, and Julia. They'll know who they are. They don't need their surnames. Uh, so just special thank you to them. And a special thank you to, to Nomad IT that's helped us through the, uh, through the systems today. Yeah. But I think it's all gone as well as it could have done, bearing in mind, you know, we've got people from here to Australia, literally. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the distance that we're traveling. So thank you all very much for participating. You know, we've appreciated your questions. We'll appreciate even more your, your, your input into the uh, sessions for the rest of the week. And, you know, you know our doors are always open, you know, and NRI.org is, uh, is, is always there. Uh, you know, we're very active, as you may know, on, on Facebook, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. You know, do make contact with us and, you know, if we can, if we can do interesting things together that's going to change things, then let's do those interesting things together that are going to change things because they really matter. Okay, wishing you all very, Thank you, all the very best. Cheerio. Goodbye, Thank everybody. You. Okay. Goodbye. Stay Bye safe, now. stay well. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.